perception and speech production. And you guys have provided me with some perception data and some production data. So uh, keep in mind as we start this unit that uh, your second project for the class will be to do a short uh, data analysis project on either the data from the speech perception experiment we did a while back where you guys listen to weird sentences with weird words at the end and noise, or on the data that you guys have generated for me here with speech errors. Okay, so you're going to pick one of those two sets of data, uh, and we're going to do data analysis. So think as we go through uh, the two different topics in this unit, which one do you think is the most interesting, which one do you think you understand the best, because you're going to want to pick the data set that you can explain in context most effectively. Because we're going to talk about how those data give us information about the speech process and what's happening in the human brain and the human mind as we process speech. Now, there are two uh, parts to the speech chain. Obviously, we have people who have to produce speech and you know they have to come up with um, some idea, they have to make their muscles work, they have to turn those ideas they have into sound, those sounds get converted into sound waves which are then picked up by the listener who receives those into his or her brain and processes that information. At the same time, the speaker hears himself or herself and can make judgments about whether or not what they produced was what they intended, and sometimes it's not, as you know, then they make an error and then they correct themselves because what they're trying to do is share information, share their ideas, and if they misshare those ideas because they're following those maxims of communication, they'll fix it to make sure, or try to fix it to make sure that the listener actually got the message that was intended. Now, the chain moves through from the linguistic level where the person is thinking in their mind about the ideas they want to convey to a physiological level where they convert those ideas into sound, so into a physical property that can be measured, captured. We're going to talk a little bit about how we capture that physiological information out in the world in the acoustic form. We're going to be looking at what speech looks like when we capture the sound waves and print them out. Um, and then it gets converted back from, that, from those sound waves into physiological electrical signals that then get converted back into ideas in the head. So you should know about those different stages, know the chain of speech that it's going through, uh, basically a, a cognitive linguistic level to a physiological process to an acoustic process and then back again. That's the conversion that we're going through using the speech chain method. The first part I want to talk about is speech perception. So this is our ability, this is what you are doing right now, perceiving what I say, taking in the information that I am generating, the acoustic sound that I'm generating, and converting it into physiological processes, right? You're converting these, the changes I'm making in the sound waves into electrical signals through your sensory nerves, and then converting them into ideas in your head. Now when we do this, we need two mechanisms. For those of you that have had cognitive you will recognize this, or if those of you that have taken cognitive will recognize these. We need top-down mechanisms and bottom-up mechanisms. So we'll start with bottom-up. Bottom-up processing, when it comes to perception, is that taking in of the signal from the world and converting it into sensory information that your body can then interpret somehow. So when you take in light information through your eyes, that's bottom-up processing. When you take in sound information through your ears, that's bottom-up processing. When you take in touch information through your skin, that's bottom-up processing. You're taking stuff in, you're taking in the message from the world and interpreting it somehow. In parallel with this <coughs> intake of information from the world, is top-down processing, which is what you bring 
to the perceptual event. So when you come to an event, you don't come to it completely naive. You have previous experiences, memories, expectations, biases, strategies for processing the world that have helped you in the past. You bring all of this cognitive baggage and all these cognitive tools with you as you experience the world. And so what you perceive, your experience of what you hear and what you see and what you smell and what you taste, isn't purely just what's coming from the world. It's also the way you think and feel and interpret what's coming from the world. And sometimes it's very difficult to tell the difference. It's hard to tell what's the bottom up part and what's the top down part because we blend those two things so seamlessly that we might actually think that what we brought to the conversation was what the speaker contributed to the conversation. We can't tell the difference. You ever had an argument with somebody and you swear you remember the argument word for word and you say, you said this, blah, 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 blah. The person says, I never said that, I said this. And both of you seem completely convinced that you're telling the truth. And that's because you probably both are. You're remembering your interpretation of what they said, and that's your memory of the event. They're remembering what they intended to say, and that's their memory of the event. And because each one represents a different combination of bottom-up and top-down information, you're both reporting the truth. That makes it a little bit complicated, right? So who's right? Well, you're both right. Um, and that's what makes communication among human beings different, which is why psychologists will always have jobs. So it's good. Be glad that we have this issue, because it's why we'll always have jobs. So we're doing this in combination, right? So the speaker is talking, giving us bottom-up information. We're bringing in this top-down information. And it could be anything. It can be, when it comes to language, it can be our judgments about the person. Have you ever had somebody talking to you and you've already decided you don't, want to, you don't care anything about what they say because you just made some decision about that person? <laughs> so they're like, blah, blah, they could be saying, they could be saying the smartest thing ever, ever said. And you can't hear it because you've already made some decision about that. Or have you had somebody do that to you? Where they decide they know the value of what you're saying or the use of what you're saying because they see you and they make some decision about your appearance, right? Or about how you're dressed or whatever. Um, so and we're always bringing in this top down stuff to filter the bottom up stuff. And it's this constant mix. It's a constant mix. And to the extent that we understand, the person who's speaking, that we share common top-down experience, then we'll probably understand them better. That's why it's easy to talk, it's easier to talk to someone who's had similar experiences to yours because you interpret things in a similar way. But when you're talking to somebody from a foreign culture or from a really different background, like you can see the same event and interpret it completely differently. Why? Because you're bringing different top-down information to filter that bottom-up experience. So when we talk about speech, we're talking about that combination, that speech perception event is a combination of those two things, um, both bottom up and top down. And we have to try and pull them apart so that we can figure out what part bottom up information is contributing to the language perception event and what part top down processing is contributing to the language perception event, because they're both relevant to us as psycholinguists. So if we think about the bottom up stuff, when we're talking about spoken language, the most obvious place for us to start is the acoustic signal. <coughs> that's a physical thing. Sound waves moving through the air. So we know that this is a physical thing coming at us from the world that's going to get picked up by the receptors in our ears. So we study sound waves in particular and look at how sound waves are used to form the sounds of speech and how they're manipulated to convey information. 
sound wave is made up of air particles that are compressed and rarefied. So as the, what I'm doing as I talk is I'm taking air particles and I'm compressing them and stretching them back out to create a sound wave. And the amount of time it takes to go through one compression or one rarefaction pattern is a cycle. So this image up here shows one cycle of a sound wave, where it goes up and down and back up to neutral. That's one cycle of a sound wave. Now, the amount of time that passes during a cycle is what gives you the frequency of a sound wave. So a high frequency sound is going really fast. It's going up and down very quickly. A low frequency sound is going very slowly. So the frequency, we talk about the frequency, we're talking about the speed with which the sound wave is moving through the cycle. Is it going very slow, that'd be a low frequency wave, or is it going very fast? That's a high frequency wave. The amount of energy in the wave affects the amplitude, how high the peaks are and how deep the troughs are. So if we think about how high that peak is or how low the trough is, that has to do with the amplitude, high amplitude sound or a low amplitude sound. Now, if you think about it, it makes sense. Frequency, how fast the wave is moving, tells you the pitch. Is it high pitch or low pitch? Okay, high pitch sound, high frequency. Low pitch sound, low frequency. Okay, so someone who could sing bass. <coughs> well, you're talking about very low frequency okay, sounds. High people who could sing a falsetto, high pitch, sound waves are going really fast. When we talk about amplitude, okay, that's measured in decibels. That has to do with the loudness, or how much energy you're putting behind the sound influences how loud it gets. So loud sounds have bigger peaks and deeper troughs. High pitch sounds get to those troughs and peaks faster. Does that make sense? So we talk about frequency in hertz. So the more hertz, the higher pitch. The fewer hertz, the lower pitch. When we talk about decibels, that's amplitude. The more decibels, the louder the sound. The fewer decibels, the quieter the sound. Make sense? Now, when we look at speech, we can record speech, obviously, using sound recording equipment. We can convert those sounds into physical visual images. So we can look at the waves as people change the pattern of sound. Uh, and we can look at people's speech and actually analyze it. And I'll tell you, when I was in grad school, or I was taking phonetics with Keith Johnson and Mary Beckman, who are two of the premier phoneticians in the country, um, there were times when we actually had test questions that were written like this. And we had to read this kind of sound image to answer the question. So this is what's called a spectrogram or a sound spectrogram. And it's the conversion of sound waves into a visual format. We've taken the acoustic energy and translated it. So what we've got over here is frequency. What we have down here is time. And what you're seeing are the sound waves as they're being modulated by a person's voice over different frequencies. And when we talk, we don't just talk at a single frequency, we talk at multiple frequencies simultaneously. Okay, so we're producing multiple levels of sound. It's all layered on top of each other. So we get this very complex sound. That's what gives people their vocal qualities and gives, you know, can give some people a very pleasant vocal quality or an unpleasant vocal quality. Uh, it has to do with how the different sound waves are layered on top of each other. So here we have someone saying the sad, 
spaniel bit my neighbor. Okay? And you'll notice as you look at this that where words stop and start, they're marked with a line, but that's not necessarily where the sound stops and starts. For example, the starts out here. And it's not until we get to the vowel that we actually see enough sound for the spectrogram to pick it up. The sad spaniel bit my neighbor. You can't tell from looking where the blank spots are, where words stop and start. There's no word stops and starts here. And yet there's a blank spot. So part of what's going on here is this is the bottom up signal. This is what you're getting. But the fact that you know where the words stop and start is a contribution from your top-down knowledge, because you wouldn't know from just listening to this signal. Have you ever been to a country or a place where they speak a language different than one you know? What's the sound like? You can hear words here and there, maybe a fraction of something, or sometimes you go somewhere where they'll they use English words for things sometimes, and a word will pop out and then it gets back into a jumble of other stuff. Well, what's going on there is you're totally immersed in bottom-up acoustic signal with no top-down information to tell you how to filter it, which is why it sounds like junk. It just sounds like blah, 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 because you don't know what to do with it. Your top-down knowledge tells you how to segment that sound in order to get some meaning out of it. So if you don't know a language, it's really hard to do that segmentation. It just sounds like a bunch of sound people are just throwing at you. You don't know what it means. That's why if you're ever learning a foreign language, in the beginning you ask people to speak slowly. Because you need them to slow down and put spaces in between the words so you can figure out what they are saying. But if I taught like this, it would drive you crazy. Because you know an awful lot about English, so I can talk quite fast. You have absolutely no problem whatsoever segmenting the speech, even though all my words are running together and there are no spaces whatsoever in between them. That's your top-down knowledge working. Okay? So, <clears throat> when we listen to speech, when we analyze what people are actually doing, we can break speech down. You can actually look at individual speech sounds and find that individual speech sounds have particular patterns. So each one of the phonemes that we know has a particular pattern. And we learn to recognize those patterns as meaningful. And we learn to translate those patterns into meaning in our mind. So we can actually trim down sound, get computers to generate artificial speech using very limited sound cues that will trigger language information in our heads. Um, what we can narrow sound down to is a combination of what we call formants and formant transitions. So if you think back to that spectrogram I just showed you, you saw that there were sometimes bands of dark energy. Let me go back and show you that again. It sounds so scary. Bands of dark energy. All right, but you can see that there are some dark bands here. Dark bands. Okay. Each one of these is a different formant. Okay. Those bands of dark energy are called formants. Those, that's where we have a lot of, uh, we have a steady state of sound. You can see them a little bit more clearly here. So here's, you know, first form and second form and third form and fourth form and first form and second form and third form and fourth form and so on. You can get up to six formants or so in human speech. And so formants are the steady state. And then as the formants, as the sounds shift into different phonemes, we get what are called formant transitions. <coughs> so formant transitions are 
that what happens at the edge of the formant as it moves from one sound to another. And it's the combination of formants and formant transitions that tells us what sound we're hearing. Now, what's kind of interesting about this is that it's not fixed. It's not just a particular transition tells us a consonant and a particular formant tells us a vowel. Although it's true that we take the consonant information from the transitions and the vowel information from the formants. Okay, so that's true. We take consonant information, write this down, I'm repeating it, it's important. We take consonant information from the transitions and we take vowel information from the formants. Okay. But take a look at this. Tell me what's odd about this. This is the combination that we need to hear to hear the syllable D. This is the combination we need to hear to hear the syllable do. What's weird about that? I mean, I'm totally fine with that. E, formants far apart, U, formants close together. But what's odd about the transitions? There's something going on there. There's something, there's a difference. Take a look at what the transitions are doing. For D, what's happening? We've got two upward transitions. Do you see that? For do, we've got one upward and one downward transition. And yet, even though the physical sound, that's what the physical sound looks like. Even though the physical sound is different, our brain hears those two as the same consonant. That shouldn't happen, right? We're effectively hearing two things that are physically different as the same thing because they're occurring in particular contexts. This is something that makes language really, really odd as a perceptual thing, that we are able to process different physical signals as the same perceptual experience. It's like we're ignoring the differences because we've learned that in this particular context, I should hear this sound this way. It's really, <laughs> even though it's different, I should ignore the differences here. Now in another place, I might hear those same differences as meaningful. But here, just ignore that. It's a very strange phenomenon. But if you listen, here's the funny part, is that you don't really, if I say D, do, you think, oh, both of those consonants are the same, right? Okay, now I want you to listen. I want you to close your eyes for a second. And I want you to listen, and I want you to tell me which syllable I'm going to say. I'm only gonna say the first part, okay? Ready? Which one am I going to say? Okay, now listen again. D. D. Which one am I going to say? It's clearly different, right? But when I say D and do, if I ask you what the first sound is, you're like, it's the same sound. Okay, now part of that is because of something called co articulation. Co articulation. Co articulation is the phenomenon whereby we change the way our mouth is shaped when we produce a consonant in order to prepare for the vowel we're getting ready to make. Okay, so think about it this way. Without making any sound whatsoever, okay, no sound whatsoever, I'm gonna get ready to say D. Okay, ready? Now I'm going to get ready to say do. Try it. Don't say anything. Just go before you make any sound. D. And do it for do. That's co-articulation. You change the way your face is shaped before you make a single sound 
So your mouth is doing one thing for the consonant, but your lips are already forming for the vowel that's coming. So we're producing one sound and preparing for the next. And depending on what sounds come on either side of a given sound, we're producing sounds differently. Now here's the thing that will blow your mind. I always think this is wild. Each one of us makes every speech sound differently than everybody else who makes it. Nobody does exactly the same thing. So each one of us, that's why each one of us has a voice that sounds a little bit different. And each one of us never says a single sound the same way twice. And yet, we think we are all speaking the same language. That's how good we are at ignoring differences. Our brain is freaking awesome. That is a really amazing thing. How much we can ignore in terms of difference and how much message we can still send even though we're ignoring a ton of stuff. I'm going to show you some more examples of formats so you can kind of hear. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to break down a, a single utterance into all the different layers of sound so that you can hear um, all the different parts. So here is the whole utterance. Welcome to Windows Media Player. Come on, let's play. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Okay, that's Peter Latifogan, one of the most famous politicians in the world. Okay, you know, among nerdy politician circles. All right, let me play it again. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Sounds totally normal, right? Well, here's all the levels that you're processing of that. Here's the first formant. That's just the first formant. Second. Now here's all three. A bird in the hand is worth doing the book. Still sounds pretty mechanical, right? Now we have to add in all the resonances. A bird in the hand is worth doing the book. And now the fricatives and the burst noises, so the stops and the fricatives. That's just the fricatives and the stop part. Okay, so now we're going to put the formants, the resonances, and the fricatives together. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Now put in the pitch changes. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And there you go. So that's all the different stuff you're processing. And those are all the different things that if we want a computer to understand speech well, it needs to be able to process. You ever talk to Siri or another speech recognition device and it gets, the, it, gets it totally wrong? It's because it's actually extremely difficult to give computers enough information that they can process all those different things. We know they're there, but it's quite difficult. And since every person is speaking differently every time, it's really kind of guessing. <laughs> and that's why they make so many mistakes. And that's why a three-year-old who cannot consistently wipe his or her bottom can do this better than almost any computer out there, no matter how expensive. Because their brain is designed to process all that stuff. And we have to teach computers how to do it. And there are things that we're doing we don't understand yet. But I think that's so cool. <laughs> OK, because I'm a nerd. All right. Back to this. So some other factors that are contributing to the bottom-up message in speech. Prosody. So it's not just formants. As you heard, there are things having to do with pitch and resonance and other stuff. So there's other things that are contributing to the message. Uh, stress. What words you stress. You can change the meaning of a message by stressing different words or different syllables. I really don't want to go. I really don't want to go. Right? I really don't want to go. Okay? Different messages. Are ch the message is changing slightly depending on the stress. Intonation. 
we can change, we can use pitch to change. So I can say, I really don't want to go versus I really don't want to go. I really don't want to go. Three totally different meanings just by changing the pitch. And then there's rate. We can talk at very different speeds. I can talk very slowly. Or I can talk really fast. And in a given lecture, I may do both. <laughs> um, and talk everywhere in between. But all of these things, all of these characteristics, are changing the physical nature of the sound signal that's coming into you. And you are having to process them in parallel with all those different pieces of sound information. And the way you perceive what's coming into you, you're taking into account all of this kind of information to help you try and figure out what that bottom-up signal is that's coming to you. If you realize someone is talking quickly, you have different expectations for what sounds they'll make than if you think they're talking slowly. And it's almost as if the mental representation you set up in your head adjusts to accommodate what you think is happening. Have you ever listened to someone that you don't know very well or someone with an accent you don't know very well and you struggle to understand them even though they're speaking English because their accent is very different? They're producing sounds in a pattern that you can't mentally accommodate and that's why you're struggling so much. But the more you listen to them, the more you're able to modify your mental representations to understand what they're saying and make adjustments. It's why sometimes parents can understand what their kids are saying. Other people are like, what did that baby say? <laughs> like, oh, he just said he wants some applesauce. It's like, he did? <laughs> it sounds like he needed to poop. You know, like, yeah, I totally didn't under, I didn't get applesauce out of that at all. You're like, oh yeah, he totally says he wants applesauce. Right? You know what I'm talking about, right? That is because the bottom up signal that's coming in, if you don't have enough experience, your top-down knowledge can't do the filtering it needs to to process it. But just in general terms, we're having to deal with all this variation in speech. And one of the ways we manage it is with top-down information. Then there's articulatory issues. There are things that the people are doing with their mouths that introduce variation. So how they're actually physically making the sound. Everybody who makes everybody who makes an alveolar sound t -t -t might touch a slightly, you know, a half a millimeter forward, a half a millimeter backward. They're going to have a little bit of variation in where they actually touch their tongue whenever they talk, and you still have to accommodate for that. How much they voice, how little they voice, how hard they make their stop, how soft they make their stop. So there's also speaker-based variation that comes from things like people's sex. Men tend to have deeper voices than women. There's age. Kids tend to have higher voices than adults. There's issues of education. People with different degrees of education may articulate differently depending on expectations in their speech communities. And then we have that context-based variation I was talking about before, that co-articulation, that depending on what sounds are happening around the sounds I'm making, I'm going to produce them differently. This is sometimes also referred to as parallel transmission. In other words, you're getting information about the vowel that's coming as I produce the consonant that comes before it, because as I form my mouth to make the consonant, my mouth is also anticipating making the vowel and making motions to make that vowel before I ever produce it. Because I'm doing this at an incredibly fast rate. And it's, it's like this crazy articulation dance. And we end up 
with speech sounds overlapping in time. So part of the ooh gets laid over the d when I say do. Part of the e gets laid over the d when I say d. So that people can actually guess what vowel is coming next. And this is important because if you can guess at the beginning of the word what's coming next, you can think ahead and anticipate what's coming. You don't have to pay as much attention to what they're actually doing because you can make good guesses about what's happening. So the better you understand someone's speech, the less you actually have to pay attention to them, the more you can just process what they say on autopilot. And that frees up your cognitive resources to think about what you're going to say in reply. Or to drive your car. Or to cook dinner. Or to make sure the kid's not falling down the stairs. Or the other 75 other things you have to do while you're having a conversation. If you really had to pay attention, hardcore attention, to the 50 billion things that person is doing, it would make your brain explode. You, don't have, you wouldn't be able to do anything, you just have to stand there because you wouldn't even be able to figure out how to walk. We have automated so much of this and we do all of this automation process, all this variation. We learn how to do this as little kids just listen to all the stuff that's going on. We're taking in that information and learning how to modify it so that when we actually do get to talking, we can do more of it automatically and less of it And we talk about this sometimes, we talk about the target gesture. Target gesture means the, the way I'm supposed to have my articulator set up to make a particular sound. So for example, the target gesture for the t or the t sound is to have the tongue hitting in a sharp tapping motion against the alveolar ridge. That's the target gesture. And the gesture I make before it and the gesture I make after it influence how I make that particular gesture. So I say t differently in string than I say it in trick or tune because different sounds are coming before and after it. And that affects how I make that one particular gesture. But at the same time, you hear trick, string, Tune, you hear t in all three cases. And that's your top down knowledge control. One way. Bright turquoise. I can totally see it against your gray jacket. Okay. okay. Let's see. How are we doing on time? We still got 10 minutes. Alright, that was important. Alright, so. <laughs> this isn't cool. You don't think this is cool? It's kind of interesting if you think about it. Just imagine all this stuff you didn't realize you were doing. That's what I find fascinating about this, is that, and this is stuff that babies can do. <laughs> babies can do this. And they get that all this stuff is important somehow. And we're just desperately trying to figure out what it is babies know and what babies can do. Because we're trying to teach computers how to do this. And every time your speech recognition technology fails, you know how far behind we are at actually getting this to happen. It's getting better. It's a lot better than it used to be. But there's still a lot we need to know. So what's some of that top-down stuff we're bringing? Well, we have experience with all of those things I just talked about. Right? So we have learned that there is going to be rate variation. There's going to be speaker variation. There's going to be co-articulation. There's going to be all those things. So we have experience with all those things that we are able to use to help us interpret that bottom-up signal. We also use other pieces of information that we have learned over time are important for the language that we are listening to. And these are things like our ability to apply categorical perception. Okay. Categorical perception is the ability to hear sounds that are physically different as the same sound. It's the ability to ignore differences that don't change meaning and pay attention to differences that do. 
So we learn, depending on the language that we're acquiring, which differences matter and which differences don't. And we focus our attention on the differences that change meaning. And we create in our minds what we call phonemic categories. So, for example, all of these sounds, all of these different formant and formant transition combinations, I will hear all of these as t. And if I hear those, I'm good. If I hear these formant transitions and other things, I will now hear d. And it will be a completely different sound. And we call them categorical because literally we think of them as kind of lined up categories right next to each other. And you can cross the boundary and all of a sudden the sound has changed to a completely different phoneme. And it's not really a transitional thing. It's not like, well, that's kind of a D and that's kind of a T sound. It's like you go, that's a D, that's a T. And you don't even think about it. It never occurs to you that someone's saying something kind of like a D, something kind of like a T. You just say it's a D or it's a T, and you just go with it. You hear it in this categorical way. Let me give you some examples. So here's the continuum of going from the D sound to the T sound in the word bad, transitioning to the word bat. And if you listen, you'll hear the person's going to say something roughly like bad, 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 and then it'll start to sound a little bit odd, but it'll still be one word or the other, and then it'll very clearly be bat, bat, bat. Bat, 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 bat. Did you hear it? Mm -hmm. Did it go bad, 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 bat, bat, bat? That's categorical perception. You cross the boundary between da and ta, and now you hear one sound and not the other sound. Now listen to it again. Bad, 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 bad. And all the bats are actually physically different, and all the bads are actually physically different. But you don't really hear them as being different, and it certainly doesn't change the meaning. There's one word where it kind of, you kind of go, is it bad or bad? Yeah, you're, you're like, I'm not really sure, but in context, you would never question if it was occurring in a sentence. It would never. And plus, what I'm doing right now is I'm like, pay attention to stuff you never pay attention to. So now you're all like, <laughs> <laughs> I hear it. Right? So, yeah, I get it. I'm cheating a little bit. Okay. So, we naturally hear speech categorically. Okay. We ignore certain kinds of variation and focus on other kinds of variation. And the variation we care about is the variation that changes meaning. So I need to know what's going to make a word bad versus bat. And as long as I can make that distinction, I don't care about any other variation you produce because all different versions of bad That'll work, and all different versions of bat. That will work. There's also things like voice onset time. The sounds that we distinguish as voiced and voiceless, for example, b and p, right? The voiced bilabial stop and the voiceless bilabial stop, the b sound and the p sound. The only difference in articulatory terms, between those two phonemes is when your vocal folds start vibrating relative to the release of the air. When I say p, p, my vocal folds don't start vibrating until after I've released the air and I'm getting ready to produce the vowel that comes after it. But when I say b, b, I actually start vibrating my vocal folds before I release the air from my lips. So in truth, the only difference between those two sounds in articulatory terms is their voice onset time. And we become sensitive. We hear voice onset time categorically too. 
So if the vocal folds start vibrating, you know, 40 milliseconds before the sound release up to about 10 or 20 milliseconds after the sound release, we'll hear both. But if they start vibrating more than 20 milliseconds after the sound release, we hear puff. So we're very sensitive to that voice onset time information. And it can change by language. So this just to make things more complicated. For example, what counts as a buff in one language might count as a p in another language. It gets tricky. So they might say, oh no, I absolutely hear that as a puff. That's a p sound. And you're like, no, no, that's definitely a b sound. And they're like, no, no, it's not. It's definitely a b sound. And you're both telling the truth because it's how your language sets up the categorical boundary. And once you set up that boundary, that's how you hear the sound. And you can't unhear it that way. Other things we're bringing to the perceptual table. We bring our lexical knowledge. So we come with a lexicon that we have built over a lifetime. Words, meanings, usages, and the different contexts in which people say these things. So we store things about how often people say certain words, how often words occur in certain contexts. Things about, it, are these words nouns or verbs or adjectives or adverbs or any of that other kind of stuff. And we also store knowledge about what words are likely to co-occur with, word, with certain words. So if I say peanut butter, you say, thank you. Right? You know that, you have a connection in your head that puts those two things together. Now, if I went to a different culture and said peanut butter jelly is not the first thing they would say. My friends in New Zealand think that peanut butter and jelly sounds like the most nasty, disgusting thing. They're like, how can you possibly feed that to your children? That is gross. I'm like, if you eat Vegemite, that's fermented flour paste. What are you talking about? That's so nasty. And they're like, Vegemite's delicious. So, you know, it's, but they're just like, peanut butter and jelly is the most disgusting thing. Like, how can you, how can you give that to children? That's just gross. And I'm like, but don't be bashful with the PB&J, man. That's like, a, that's, a, that's a fundamental kid food. That's like mashing macaroni and cheese. Just don't even know it. Chicken nuggets, right? I mean, just don't. I don't like, I don't eat chicken nuggets. But American kids and chicken nuggets, they go together. OK. So there's also stuff we know about rate normalization. So we are able to listen to speech and in our head, we can hold very fast speech in our head in a buffer, and we can actually slow it down a little bit so that we can hear. So we don't always process the incoming speech at the same time it's coming in. We might be holding it in a buffer. You ever had this happen where someone says something to you and you go, what? And then before they can repeat themselves, your brain goes, oh, this is what they said. <laughs> and then they repeat it again. You're like, oh, I heard you the first time. And they're like, why did you ask that? <laughs> 